Okay, in this week's Weather Extra, we're going to touch on a subject that you've heard a lot about over the last few weeks, and for very good reason. We're going to talk about atmospheric rivers again, just because there's a lot that still needs to be cleared up about these, especially considering how impactful they've been for Northern California over the course of the last three weeks. And you can see this most recent one, which made landfall at the start of the week on uh, last Monday. And we've gotten used to seeing these now on this map. This is the water vapor imagery, which shows us where the higher concentrations of water vapor are in the atmosphere. You can see there's the West Coast, San Francisco. You're looking out across the Pacific. The brighter the color, the higher the concentration of water vapor in the atmosphere. This is how you can identify where an atmospheric river is. And we give it the term atmospheric river for a very good reason. Oftentimes, in a typical one of those narrow ribbons of higher concentrations of water vapor, which can sometimes get pointed right at us, there is as much water within that flow in the atmosphere as you would have in the Mississippi River. And that is fuel for a storm to deliver much more rain than it otherwise would have should it tap into this. And that's what's happening, by the way. An atmospheric river by itself is not a storm, but an atmospheric river is a component of a storm. It's a piece of a storm. It's an ingredient that can get pulled into a storm to supercharge it with a lot more water vapor. Now, one of the items that's come up with the terminology for atmospheric river is, hey, wait a minute. I remember we used to just call these the Pineapple Express. Is this a way for you just to kind of uh, mask the issue or to make it sound more confusing or to make it sound more ominous than it needs to be? None of those are true. Yes, we used to call these Pineapple Express before we started recognizing how widespread these are across the globe. Back in the 80s, back in the 90s. But in the last 10 years, there's been a lot more research into these and we're recognizing how pervasive they are globally, and how important they are, and how they can have different characteristics depending on where they're coming from. The one that we got this week did not come from Hawaii. That one is streaming all the way across from the other side of the Pacific, almost more in the mid-latitudes. If it had been coming from Hawaii, it'd be coming up from much warmer latitudes, it would have warmer conditions to it, and it would be a more typical Pineapple Express. You can still use the term if you want for fun. But not all atmospheric rivers are pineapple expresses. We need to start giving these things different terms, a term that will apply globally. Because if you look across the globe, there's another one right now. They're happening all the time. This one's getting pulled up out of the Caribbean and moving over Cuba, and a small element of it is, in fact, going up to Great Britain. Do you call that a pineapple express? Shouldn't. You should call it an atmospheric river, and that way we can kind of unify the term and that helps with the messaging, proper labeling, and making sure we understand these things correctly. The term actually came from an organization here in California down at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. That's down in San Diego, but a specific branch coming out of there called the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. These are the folks who have pioneered our understanding of atmospheric rivers over the last decade. They've come up with the terminology, they've come up with the labels, and they've come up with a way to forecast them. And that's where this gets real interesting. This is their homepage. If we explore the homepage a little bit, we come to a whole series of tools that they've put together and made available to the public over the last few years. And I wanna zero in on one of them right here, atmospheric river forecasts. We can go to the page for that. And when we do that, we can pull out another image of the West Coast. We can look out across the Pacific here with a bunch of different color blobs on it. And there's a setting up here. The setting is telling you how much water vapor is out here in the Pacific right now, going all the way across the different latitudes and longitudes in relation to California. The setting right now is right about moderate. We can go up there and change the setting. Right now it's on 500. If we click on that, we can check out, let's put it on 250. 250 is just a reading. We won't get too deep into the weeds on here, but it's a reading that tells you how much water vapor is in the atmosphere. A better way of thinking about that is 250 kilograms of integrated vapor transport. I'm not going any deeper into this than that, but that means that would be categorized as a weak atmospheric river. It still shows up. We've got all the ingredients out here, but there's not as much water vapor being transported as quickly or through as much of the column of the atmosphere as there would be if it was at 500. Let's go back up 
And we're going to switch now just to check in on 500, because what we care about here is that moderate level, and that's where what 500 corresponds to. A moderate strength atmospheric river. And lo and behold, when we look at the atmospheric river that we experienced on Monday, November 8th, I'm going to put that one on the scale in relation to the atmospheric river that we experienced all the way back on Sunday, October 26th. That was the record setting one. It was the strongest atmospheric river we'd ever had in Northern California in the month of October and the fourth strongest atmospheric river at any point of the year that we've ever had since we started keeping records of these things. That one was off near the top of the charts. It was extreme. The one that we experienced on Monday, November 8th, the most recent one, registered here, right at around that 500 level on that chart we were looking at, or to simplify the matter, moderate. Moderate atmospheric rivers are good. They bring beneficial impacts to the landscape. They bring just the right amount of rain that you can handle it without flooding. Extreme atmospheric rivers are not good, except for the one we had on October 26th, because that one, with its extreme amounts, that would have been up around 1,200 kilograms for that reading. You know, this one was 500. That one was around 1,200. It's just telling you how much water vapor is being transported in scientific terms. If we'd gotten one like that at the end of winter on a landscape that wasn't already extremely dry from a record-setting drought, we would have had significant flooding from that. And the reason why the work Scripps is doing is so important is to help us recognize these things before they get here, to help identify the unique characteristics of them and to better prepare for them because the biggest floods in California, all of the big record setting floods in California come from atmospheric rivers, usually in that category. So if we can get a bunch like that over the course of the winter in the moderate range, it'll be great all around. It'll help with the drought and we won't have to be too concerned about flooding. All the terminology, Having developed a lot more over the last 10 years, we can thank the scientists working hard at Scripps. We can thank them for unifying the term atmospheric river because Pineapple Express doesn't cut it. This is far too big of an issue for that term, especially in terms of it being a global phenomenon, but one of particular importance here in California. That's this week's Weather Extra. Paul Hagan will be in next week with another one.